In this video, we're going to learn how to place floors in our architectural project. To begin with, come underneath the Architecture tab and then find the Floor tool, then select on Floor. When you do this, we'll see a variety of different floors that we can select off of the Type Selector list underneath Properties. Now to be honest, none of these floors really match the kind of floor that we want to do in this project. In other words, this is the first floor of our building, and I want to have a floor that's going to be actually on grade. In this case though, since we don't have one that matches up just perfectly, and I don't want to create a new one from scratch just yet, move over and select the generic 12 inch floor off of the list. It can always be replaced or adjusted after the fact. Once you've selected on the floor generic 12 inch, make sure that the level here just says level one, check your drawing tools, and what we're going to do is we're going to draw all the way around the perimeter of this with the floor. Now, structurally speaking, this probably isn't the best thing that we could do. But just to demonstrate how floors work, this should work really well. Move up here and select on the rectangle tool. And you notice that you can't really pick on the intersection of these two spots very well. So just click at the intersection of one of these. We'll adjust it after the fact and then pick on the intersection of another one of these mullions. Hit escape a couple times on the keyboard, pick on this line here, and then just drag it down until it lines up with this line here. It'll even kind of snap into place. Do the same thing with the line going up across the top. Click on it, drag it up. Then when it's even with that line going across the top, click the let go. If you zoom back out, you should see this purple or magenta line going all the way around the outside of the building. Then, if you click the big green check mark, we'll now have a floor in that location. To verify this, come up to your 3D icon and click on the little house. And you should now see a floor going all the way around the perimeter of your first floor. As I mentioned, after the fact, we could always adjust it. And when I say that, I mean that you could select on the floor and then pick a different floor off of the type selector list if you wanted to, such as generic 12 inch filled. And now it's replaced with that type of floor as opposed to the other type of floor that it was. Now let's draw in another floor up here on the second floor. We'll need to go to our level two floor plan by just double clicking there on level two we can see what's going on right here with some of these taller walls, as well as some of these walls that are grayed out. The grayed out walls are the ones that are short. They're actually below our second floor. These ones that are darker, they're coming up through the second floor and going up to some of the floors up above. Now we could always modify our floor so that it will have holes for each of these walls, or we can adjust the walls themselves so they'll just go up to the underneath side of the floor. We have a variety of different things that we could do. But in this case, move up here to the Architecture tab again, select on the Floor tool, use the Line tool this time, and let's start to draw, beginning with this intersection right here. Zoom out, zoom back in, and then click right there at the end of this curtain wall. The next thing I like to do is click this Pick Walls tool, and then check this checkbox that says extend in the wall core. When we do that and then move our mouse over, we'll see a little dashed line will show up toward the middle of this wall. And this is the core or the structural part of the wall. So what we're getting ready to say is this floor is going to go through the structural part of this wall. In fact, it's going to have the walls up above it sit on top of the floor while the floor itself will sit on the wall down below. So it's going to partially support the walls up above as well as be supported by the walls down below. And that's because extend in the wall core is checked. If extend in the wall core was not checked, you'll notice that you don't get that dash line except for up here at the top as well as the bottom. It's there, it's just very hard to see. So check extend in the wall core, move your mouse until you see that dash line and then click in order to place it. We'll make this connection here in just a second. Once again, pick the line tool. We're going to start there. And now we're basically just going to play connect the dots, zooming in and zooming out by using the wheel on the mouse to draw our walls all the way around the perimeter. Bring it back to the start. Then zoom in here 
and hit escape a couple times on the keyboard. Let's just bring this over so they're almost touching each other. The next thing I like to do is kind of eliminate the thickness of these lines so that I know exactly where they need to go. So I'm going to select on the view tab and then turn thin lines on. Now click on the line and then drag it over until it gets to that line right there. Now we can see that they're right over the top of each other. And when you do that, you can use the line command to draw from there to there and hit escape a couple of times on the keyboard. Do that same process over here at the other end. Line, connect them. Now that all the lines are connected and if you could follow it around with your finger, you go all the way from the start to the end. Click the big green check mark to finish that floor. It'll ask an important question. Would you like the walls that go up to this floor's level to attach to its bottom? So things like this curtain wall, would you like it to just go to the bottom of the wall? In this case, we're gonna say yes to that. It's given us a warning message, but I'm not too worried about it. It's basically saying that it's gonna to have to delete some of the mullions if it does this. For our purposes right now, that's fine. So click on delete elements. Then it'll give us another big warning message telling us that on the highlighted walls, it's going to cut some of the material out of that wall. And is that gonna be okay? And in this case, it's exactly what we wanted to do. So say yes to that. By doing that, we now have a floor up on our second level. Also, if we go to this section view and double click really fast on the circle, if you zoom in, you'll see the floor is sitting on the structural part of the wall and then the next part of the wall is sitting on top of the floor. When it asked, do you want to cut that extra material out of the wall? It was talking about cutting that extra material out there between where the floor is now located at. I'm going to click on the X to get out of this view. Now, an easy zooming trick is if you double click on the wheel on your mouse. That'll do an automatic zoom extent. So I just double clicked on the wheel. And if you come now to the 3D view icon and select on it, you'll be able to see that there's a floor here as well as a floor here. So to draw your floors in, move up to the architecture tab, ideally be in a floor plane view, though you don't necessarily have to be, find the floor command, and then choose the appropriate tools off of the list in order to be able to draw that shape of the floor in wherever you need it to be. Then when it's all said and done, click the big green check mark in order to finish your floor. In this video, we're gonna learn how to edit the sketch of an existing floor. And what this means is edit the way that the existing floor currently is formed. In this particular instance, we'll be able to see that this part of the building has a floor going all the way through it. Now there's two different ways that we can add openings to a floor. One way is to use what's called an opening object in the floor. The other way is modify the sketch of the floor so that there's a hole right in that location of the floor. To accomplish this, we first need to select on the floor object. And we're on level two. And honestly, selecting on this floor object could be easy or it could be difficult. The reason why I say that is, is that if you move up here toward the top, you may accidentally select on such things as the curtain wall or select on one of those exterior walls. And if we want to grab onto the floor, we can't just window around it because that won't select it. One way that you can grab onto a floor is just window around everything in the view, coming up to the filter, which will show up on the ribbon, and then clearing out the check mark next to each of these different items except for the floor. Then if you click on OK, you'll only have the floor selected. The other way that you could do it though, is if the floor wasn't selected, is that you can move your cursor over to right about where the edge of the floor is at, then click the tab key on your keyboard. Eventually, that floor will highlight and you can click in order to select the floor. So by hitting the tab key, it will cycle through the different objects that are sitting there and eventually it'll give you your floor to click on. Once you have your floor highlighted, there's an option that says edit boundary. If you select on that, you'll see these purple slash magenta lines going all the way around where the floor's boundary has been at. At this point, if I selected on any of these lines, I could then delete it or modify it or draw in new lines, whatever the case may be. For this instance though, I'd like to add a hole right in this area. 
A fast way for me to do that is to select on the rectangle command and draw in some extra lines. Once I have those in place, I even have the opportunity to lock these by clicking on the little padlocks that show up. What this will do is if any of these walls should move a few inches in this direction or a few inches in that direction, then the floor will update as well to match the opening that those walls are trying to create. Whenever this is done, click on the big green check mark. It'll ask, would you like the walls to go up to this floor's level to attach to its bottom? I'll say yes to that. And now it's referring to any walls that may have been in a level down below. Would we still want those to attach to the bottom of the floor? And the answer to that question was yes. Now it's difficult to see whether or not it's cut that opening right now. But if you move down here and select on this box and click on shaded, we can then see the gray area is where the floor is located at. And the white area is that new hole that we just created. So if you ever need to make a modification to a floor, the first thing you need to do is select the floor. And you can either use your tab key by coming over to the edge of the floor and hitting tab until it highlights, or just window around the floor and then filter out everything but your floor object. Then once you have it, you can do edit boundary to make modifications to either the exterior or interior boundaries to change your floor shape. You can add arcs, circles, and a variety of other shapes to create pretty much any kind of floor condition as far as outer dimensions are concerned that you might need for your flooring conditions. Once you have a floor in place, one of the things that you can do is copy that floor and that floor condition up to level three as well as level four. To do this, we need to begin by selecting on the floor. If you're able to find the edge of the floor right there at the edge of where the curtain wall is at, click in order to select it. Next, there's a tool and it's called copy the clipboard. That's different from the normal Revit copy command, which is over here. You wanna select the copy the clipboard command. Once you've done that, you'll notice that paste becomes available. Click on the word paste, then select align to selected levels. When you do this, it'll ask you a question. Which levels would you like to have your floor copied up to? Click level three to start with, hold down control, and then select level four. Holding down control allowed you to select more than one at a time. Click OK. Now immediately it looks like nothing special has happened, but in the background, it's copied this floor up to level three as well as level four. Now go to your 3D view to take a look at it. And we can see it's copied that floor up to each of those levels. Now in this case, I really want my level four to be a roof object. So click on the floor and then hit the delete key on your keyboard. And that'll get rid of that particular floor up there on top. Now that we've done that, we can spin it around and we can take a look at how that floor looks in our plan. Remember, all you need to do is select on a floor, come over here to copy the clipboard then choose paste and then align it to selected levels. And this also works with such things as our ceilings, furniture, and anything that might be on that level that we would have selected. It'll make exact copies of those going all the way on up your building to any levels that you select. In this lesson, why opening objects are good for cutting holes in floors, ceilings, as well as roofs. To begin by placing an opening object, we need to come underneath the architecture tab and the kind of opening object that we want to place will be a shaft opening. This is specifically designed for going from floor to floor. After selecting shaft, pick your rectangle tool off of the list, click one of the upper corners of the room, then draw a rectangular shape. The exact dimensions don't matter so much, just make it somewhere between maybe 19 foot six and 20 foot. We can always adjust this after the fact when it comes time to place the actual staircase and then click when you have that rectangular shape in place. Let's take a look at the properties of this opening that we just created. One of the things that we know is that it has a base constraint of a level one. If yours doesn't, that's okay. Just make sure that here on the list, it says level one is the base constraint. If there's any offsets on yours between base offset being zero, zero, or top offset zero, zero, just change it to be zero, zero if it says anything different. For the top constraint, change that to be level three. By making the top constraint level three, 
This means create a hole through level two and up through level three, which is the exact opening that we want for our shaft for our staircase to fit inside of. Click on apply. Then move over here and click the big green check mark for okay. When you do this, even though we can't really see a difference on this floor, we've now created a hole on our other floors. To see this, double click on your level two or double click on your level three and you'll see that line and that's where your opening is at. To really see the opening, take a look at it in a 3D view by selecting on the little house. You may need to spin this around by holding the shift key down in the wheel at the same time. You'll then be able to see that opening that's going through each of these individual floors. So the opening command can be found underneath architecture and opening and if you want to cut through multiple different layers of material, such as roof, your floors, and your ceilings, use the shaft opening tool to accomplish this task. In this exercise, I'd like to create a sloped floor inside of a garage area. To accomplish that, we need to use the floor command to draw a floor in first, and then use what's called a slope arrow to have the floor slope in the direction that the slope arrow indicates. Begin by coming underneath the Architecture tab and picking on Floor. Then use the Rectangle tool to draw in from one interior wall to the opposite interior intersection of walls, a rectangle. Click on each of these little padlocks. This is going to lock our floor in to be flush with the face of each of these walls. So if any of these walls should move, the floor will move along with it. Next, we want to add that Slope Arrow. So you select on Slope Arrow and then right in the middle of the top line, click. That's gonna be the base point for our slope arrow. And then right here in the middle of this line, click. And now this is our slope arrow going from here to here. Before we click the big green check mark up there, we need to check some of the properties over here in the properties area. Right now we can see that the slope arrow has a specified height at tail. What this means is that technically the slope arrow can either have a percentage slope that we can type in or an exact height at one end and then an exact height at the other end. And that's what height at tail means. So let's leave it at height at tail, even though we could enter a slope if we wanted to. Now, as far as height offsets go, one foot is way too much. I'm just gonna make this be one inch. It'll be one inch higher at this end than it will be at this end. Zero is just fine for me here for the height at the other end. So click the big green check mark there. It gets to be a little hard to tell what has happened. So let's look at this in a 3D view now. You may need to spin this model around so you can see it from this direction. And the easiest way to do that would be to just click the word right here on your view cube. When you do that, it'll take you to this view. And if you look really close, you'll see that this end here is in fact higher than this end over here. It's sloping in the exact direction of the slope arrow, and it's one inch difference from here down to here, just like we specified. So by using the slope arrow, you can create a floor that slopes in the direction that the slope arrow indicates, as well as specify what the height would be at one end of the slope arrow and the other end of the slope arrow, or you could even specify a certain percentage of slope and have the floor follow the slope arrow at that percentage of the slope. In this exercise, we're gonna learn how to replace an existing floor with a different type of floor, as well as modify the properties of an existing floor so that it has the right properties for the type of construction we're trying to accomplish. To do this, we're going to zoom in so that we can see some of the different floors in our 3D view. Now move your mouse up and then highlight over the second floor and click. Highlight over the third floor then hold your control key down on your keyboard and then select the third floor. When you do this, you'll now have both of these floors selected and we'll see underneath the type selector list that these are the floor generic 12 inch. If you click there, we'll see that there's a variety of other floors that we could choose from. In this case, 12 inch is way too thick for this kind of floor. We're just gonna pick the three inch lightweight concrete on a two inch metal deck. By doing this, we can see that both of these floors are now thinner as they've taken on the properties of a three inch lightweight concrete floor on two inch metal deck. The properties that make this floor up can be found underneath edit type and then selecting the edit button next to the word structure. 
we can see that this is made up of lightweight concrete and the total thickness of this floor is five inches in thickness. Now click down here where we have the OK button to get out of this dialog box and then click again where we have the OK. Click somewhere out here in space. Now move your mouse over and then highlight this floor, the sloping floor on the inside of a garage area. You'll notice it too is a generic 12 inch floor. Now, realistically speaking, this is way too thick for a garage floor. It should be more like four inches in thickness. So to be able to make an adjustment to that, we'll come down here to edit type, move up here and select on the duplicate button. And we're gonna call this four inch garage floor and click on okay. Next, click on the edit button and change the thickness to be four inches. Also, when you do this, you see there's an option here for material. Click where it has by category, then select on this little box over here on the side. This is gonna bring up the material dialog box. We can start to look for different materials that we might use on our project, including different concretes. Now we could choose any of these that we wanted to off of the list. Since concrete lightweight is what we use on the other floors, that's just gonna be what I pick here but we could have picked any of these other ones off of the list. When we do this, we can see what the pattern of it would look like in a plan view, as well as in a section view. This is also, underneath materials, the reason why each of these objects display the way that they do. You assign it the right material, and it'll have the right display representation inside of your model environment. Click on OK. So we have concrete structure, four inches thick. Click on OK again. One more time, click on OK. And we can now see this floor is still highlighted, but it's now a four inch garage floor and it's drawn in right in this location. So to make modifications to the floors, you can use select on the floor and pick a new floor off of the type selector list, or you can select on your floors, come over to edit type, edit, and then adjust its properties accordingly inside of the edit assembly dialog box. In this exercise, we're going to learn how to place a flat roof over the top of our main building. One of the things I'd like to do is come over here to where level four as well as level five is located. And that's underneath the floor plans in the project browser. Now, level four and level five are really badly named. Level four is our roof level. Level five is the top of parapet, which means the top of where these walls are located at. So let's rename these to correspond with what these levels actually are. To do that, highlight on level four, right click on it, and then go to rename. From here, type in roof and click on okay. When it asks, would you like to rename the corresponding level and views, just tell it yes. By doing this, you're renaming the ceiling plan for that level to be called roof. Now, realistically, we'll probably never place a ceiling on that level, but that's what it's doing. For level five, do the same thing. Highlight it, right click, and then go to rename. And we're just gonna call this T-O-P for top of parapet and click on okay. Hit yes. We can see it's renamed it underneath ceiling plans as well. Now, because this is gonna be our roof plan, at least for the main roof, we're gonna double click on the word roof underneath floor plans. And now we're in the roof plan view. Currently we're looking down and we can see some walls. We're going to draw a roof in all the way around the perimeter here. To accomplish that, we need to activate the roof tool from underneath the architecture tab on the ribbon. Select on roof. And before you do your first click, there's an option here that says define slope. This is going to be a flat roof. We don't want it to have any slope. So clear that checkbox out. Next, over here toward the right hand side. And most likely you won't have this box. If you do, click on the word draw. What you probably see is this dialog box right here. In which case you want to select line off of the list because we're going to draw lines that will indicate where the perimeter of our roof is going to be. Let's start picking points. So I'm going to click once. I'm going to come down to the bottom and click. Come over and click. As much as possible grabbing the intersections of each of these spots. Coming straight over. I'm going to come over and click going right to the inside of this wall, continuing to click all the way on around until we come back to our original point. 
After connecting all these points and we have this pink, purple, magenta line going all the way around, this is going to be the perimeter of our roof. And we'll want to click the big green check mark to that. Next, let's take a look at this in a 3D view so we have a better idea as to what just occurred. Here we can see we have the roof. Unfortunately though, it now has walls coming up through the top of it. Now that's okay with these walls over here, but it's not something I want to have in these different wall conditions here. What we're going to do is we're going to pick each of these walls, and by holding down the control key on your keyboard, you can highlight each of these interior walls. The next thing we'll want to do is bring these walls down so they're at the underside of this roof. We want to come over to the Attach Top Base tool that shows up here on the ribbon. Select Attach Top Base, move down, and then when the roof itself is highlighted, click on the roof. This will automatically drop the top of those walls down so that they're flush with the bottom of this roof. By going through these steps, and probably the most important step was when we clicked on roof, clearing the Define Slope checkbox, that meant that we would have a flat roof when we were done. So by going up to Architecture and selecting on roof, defining the perimeter and where we'd want to place the roof at, and ultimately clicking the big green check mark, you can draw a flat roof in for your building. In this exercise, we're going to add a gable roof to this building over here on the side. Now a gable roof is the kind of roof you see on many residential buildings today. And that goes from here, we'll slope up, come to a point, and then slope back down again. To accomplish this, we need to go to a level where we're going to place the roof. In this case, level 2 is probably going to make the most sense for us. So double click where level 2 is at, then zoom in to the garage area. Once you've zoomed into the garage area, come underneath the architecture tab and pick the roof tool. When you activate the roof tool, we have a couple different things that we should think about. The first thing is, is underneath properties here, which type of roof do we want to place over our garage? And you notice that currently it's set as being a generic 12 inch roof. That's pretty thick. So let's pick on the type selector list and see if there's anything else here that makes more sense. Probably the one that does in this case is going to be the Wood Rafter 8 inch asphalt shingles insulated. Come up here to the edit type, move up here to edit structure, and when you do this, you can see each layer of material that makes up this roof. If you wanted to change any of these layers of materials, you could do that at this time, including the thickness as well as the material involved with it. Now click on OK, click on OK. Now we're going to start to draw this roof in. Move over here to Define Slope and put a check mark next to Define Slope. This slope is only going to be effective for two sides. So after we draw two lines, we're going to clear this checkbox out. The two sides that are going to have a slope will be this side, it's going to slope up, and then this side is going to slope up in this direction. And they're going to meet at a point right down the middle of the building. Also, we're going to have a two foot overhang here. Make sure that the Pick Walls tool is selected off of the ribbon, and then highlight over one of the walls. Make sure that the dash line is on the outside of the wall. If it's on the inside, it's not going to work because it's going to drain the roof directly into your garage. So make sure this dash line is on the outside, that's the two foot overhang, and then click. When you do this, we can see that it's going to start off as being a 912 sloped roof. We could have that, but frankly, I don't want anything that's that steep. That's a pretty steep roof. Let's change that to be a 412 slope roof, then clicking out in the space to finish that command. Now we're going to do the same thing over on the other side, making sure the dash line is on the outside of the building, clicking on the dimension and changing it to a four inch. Now this is the important part, clear defined slope out because we do not want a slope that comes in this direction or in this direction. We just want this to be a triangular pointed gable end. So click on this wall, making sure the dash line's on the outside as well as this wall with the dash line being on the outside. When you've done that, and select on the big green check mark. Now if you get a message saying, do you want to connect the walls to the roof? Then just say no to that message for right now and you'll be in the exact same spot that we're at currently. Take a look at this in 3D. You'll see that your walls are in fact going through your roof and definitely not the way that you want it to be. To fix this, click on each of these walls. And while there's a variety of ways to select multiple walls, 
The easiest for right now would just be to hold the tab key down on your keyboard as you select on each of the walls. Once they're all highlighted, come up to Attach Top Base, select on that command off of the ribbon, and then pick on the roof. It's given a warning message, but its complaint is the fact that it can't create that top cap at the top of the wall. It's also having a problem with the brick soldier course that was at the top of the wall. I don't really care about that detail in this design. So we're just gonna click the red X to get out of the warning box. Click out in space to finish off the command. Then if we rotate this around by holding down the shift key on the keyboard and the wheel on the mouse, we can see that this now has a gabled roof and the walls are cleaning up fine at that roof surface. So to draw the gable, just remember, whenever you're executing the roof command, put a check mark next to define slope for each side you wanna have slope up to make the gable. In this exercise, we're gonna take a look at how a roof is actually constructed as far as its material properties are concerned. To see that, you have a couple different ways. You can either execute the roof command off of the architecture tab up above, or just select on one of the roofs that are already there in the project. In this case, I'm selecting on the roof that's over this garage area over here on the side. And we can see that it's a basic roof, wood rafter, eight inch. If we click on the type selector list, we can see a list of all the different roofs that are currently loaded into this project. Some of these are generic, which means they only have one material and it's just a generic material. So it has no real material properties associated with it. Other things, such as the concrete deck, have concrete material or a steel material associated with the steel truss. The slope glazing, it has glass material associated with it. If you have a roof that's sloping and it's made out of a glass panel, that's how you create it, with the sloping glazing of the roof. But let's take a look here at the properties of this basic roof wood rafter. Just click somewhere near your drawing area and select on the edit type button. When you do this, you'll see the Type Properties dialog box. Click on Edit next to Structure, you'll get Edit Assembly. This has the thicknesses of each material that make up your roof. If you want to change the thickness of any of these materials, simply highlight in the box, type in the number you'd like it to be, and then click in another box, and it will make that change. I'm going to change this back to 7.5 inches, and then just click back in the box. So these roofs are constructed underneath edit type and the properties, and then I'm gonna click okay to this dialog box, selecting on the edit button next to structure to get to the edit assembly dialog box, which has each of the roof materials, as well as the thickness of each of those materials that make up your roof. Ceiling planes are used to document the way that a ceiling or the light fixtures up above a certain height are represented. Inside of Revit, it's not underneath floor plans that we need to be looking, but we need to look underneath ceiling plans. And in this case, double click on level one to bring up what's technically called the reflected ceiling plan, looking straight up in level one. If we zoom out just a little bit, we'll see this building over here on the right hand side. This is our little garage area that we have sort of out in the back of the building. This line going right down the middle is the peak or the gable there on the roof that's covering that garage. What we're seeing here in this view is that currently there are no ceilings in place. Those still need to be drawn. But this wide area is actually the underside of the floor for the level up above. So that we have a better idea as to what it is that we're looking at when we're looking at a ceiling plan. Come underneath properties scroll down and toward the bottom of the properties list there'll be an option there called view range select on the edit button next to view range we'll see a primary range option and we'll see a cut plane as well as a top plane right now it says that seven foot six off of level one is where we're cutting through the floor plan at so imagine if your head was at seven foot six up in the air and you were looking straight up that's exactly what's happening here then the top is level two above, zero feet, zero inches. So at exactly level two, that's as far up as we can see. If we wanted to see beyond or be able to see up higher than level two, we could either change this information here or we could select another level that was even higher up on the list. If we wanted to be able to see below where the cut plane is at, we could change this offset distance so it was a smaller number 
and then we'd be able to see further down and be able to catch more things which might be lower than the cut plane. So the reflected ceiling plan, or just called ceiling plan, if I click on OK, is looking up as opposed to looking down like you'd have in a floor plan view. In this video, we're going to learn how to place ceilings in our reflected ceiling plane views. To do this, of course, we need to be inside of a reflected ceiling plan. Make sure that underneath the project browser, that you're currently underneath level one ceiling plans. Probably the most common mistake is if someone tries to place a ceiling and they do it inside of a floor plan by accident. Because initially, they look almost identical. Well, if you try to do that, it will place the ceiling in, but you won't be able to see it. What happens is it'll show up on the reflected ceiling plan because in the ceiling plan, you're looking up. But the reason why you can't see it in the floor plan views because in floor plan views, you're looking down. So always place your ceilings initially inside of a ceiling plan view. Now we're going to place a ceiling inside of this office area between A and B. To do that, we need to come underneath the architecture tab and select on ceiling. When we do, we need to look underneath properties to see which type of ceiling it's going to place inside of the space. In this case, it's a 2x4 ACT acoustical tile system ceiling. Also, we can see the height, and in this case, it's 8 foot. So if we place it in here currently, it'll be 8 foot off of level 1, or 8 foot off of the ground. In this case, I'd like it to be at least a little bit higher than 8 foot off of the ground. So I'm going to type in 9 foot and we'll have a nine foot ceiling inside of this office space. Now, if you move your cursor into this area, you'll see a red line showing up around the office walls. This is a good thing. This is where it's gonna to try to place the ceiling into. Up here, you'll see this says automatic ceiling. What's actually going on here is that it's finding where those outside walls are at and it's automatically placing this ceiling inside of this space. So it's making this decision for you. Do you wanna place it inside of this space? or inside of this space, or inside of this space. In this case, yes, we want to place it inside of the office area. And by just clicking, we've now placed a nine foot elevation acoustical tile system inside of the room. Now I'm going to do the same thing, except over in these two spaces here. But these are going to be restrooms. And frankly, I don't really want to have ACT inside of my restrooms. I want a different kind of material. So I'm going to pick this JIP board material, the GWB on metal stud. And I'm going to change the height offset from being 9 foot to 8 foot 6. So we'll have a little bit lower ceilings inside of here. Now just click the place and do one more time over in the next restroom. Initially, it looks like nothing has happened, but that's because in Revit, by default, and this can be changed, the Jipboard ceilings don't have a pattern associated with them. Now it can be assigned any pattern that you want it to have. So it looks like a bunch of little dots or maybe triangles or something along those lines. But that being said though, in order to see if these ceilings actually were placed, one trick is to move down here, highlight over visual style, and then change the visual style to be shaded. When you do, you should see this get a lot darker where that ceiling is gonna be placed at. As a result of this, you know that you're gonna have ceiling inside of both of those spaces. Next, I'm going to come over here and I'm going to select on yet a different type of ceiling. I can do the generic, or in this case, I think I'm just going to pick on this 2x2 two two ACT system. And I'd really like to place it inside of this room, but I can see that I'm going to have a problem. I only want it inside of this space right here, not have it fill up this entire space out here. So to accomplish that, I'm going to have to sketch my ceiling in. So I'm going to come up here to sketch and select on sketch. Then I'm going to pick my draw tools and use my line work to draw around where I want the boundary for my ceiling to be. One quick tip, if you move over here, just highlight over the intersection and move out, you'll get this dashed line. When you do that, you know that you're straight across from that wall. Move across, click, come back up and click again. Now at the eight foot six height, I'm going to have this two by two tile put in here and click the big green check mark to finish that off. I'm going to click out here in the white area. And now we can see we have ceiling in each of these spots. Now I'd like to go through the same process one more time, except in this case, I'm going to put a ceiling in this spot here and I do want it to be jipboard again. I'm going to do one more ceiling. 
going to choose the GWB, the gypsum wallboard ceiling. And one thing of interest, you can see if I click right now, it's going to put a ceiling right into this space. The problem is, is it'll try to cover up this ceiling here. But really I have one of two different options. I can either use sketch ceiling and take the time to pick each and every one of these walls, or to speed things up, choose the automatic ceiling, accept this height offset, eight foot six sounds good to me right now, click right inside of the space. We can see this is all turned gray, but even though this pattern hasn't changed, I can tell you that there's actually two ceilings inside of the space. I'm gonna hit escape right now. Now I'm gonna put my mouse over the edge of where I know a corner of the ceiling is at. And I'm gonna select on the tab key to try to select my different ceilings. Now in this case, actually my ceiling is coming in here, so I need to pick a different edge. I'm gonna pick the edge right here. I'm gonna click the tab key until just that ceiling highlights. And you can see that in the lower left-hand side of the screen, it'll say ceilings, compound ceilings on the gray bar going across the bottom. When you click, it'll highlight. You can then do an edit boundary to this. And at this point it gets easy because all you need to do is use your draw tools, pick a line and draw one line over, hit escape a couple of times, highlight on each of these lines, click the delete key to get rid of these extra lines. And with this final line, you can select on it, click the dot and pull it straight down and click the big green check mark whenever you're done. When you do that, you'll then have a ceiling just in those areas. And even though that seemed like it was a lot of clicks, it was a lot less than clicking each and every spot going all the way around the room until you went all the way around in a circle. Now we have a ceiling in each of these areas. And we'll be able to see that, particularly over here, if we double click on the circular area here, which is a section going through our space. This is a section. I'm going to click right here on the visual styles turn this to shaded and here's that ceiling and here's the floor up above and we can see the space in between those areas and we can see that ceiling going all the way across in our building may they be walls or floors or roofs many things inside of Revit are made up of multiple layers and materials to take a look at how a ceiling is put together let's zoom in here on our reflected ceiling plan view in this case, it's a reflected ceiling plane view for level one. Click on one of the individual lines that makes up the ceiling tile. Now go over to properties and select edit type. You can then select on edit next to the word structure. This is gonna show each of the layers of material that make up this particular ceiling. The structure is one and five eighths inch thick and the finished material is an acoustical ceiling material that's 5 eighths of an inch thick. If we change the thicknesses here, it would change the actual thicknesses of how the ceiling is modeled. We can find the total thickness up here as it adds these dimensions together. Now I'm gonna select on OK and OK to get out of this particular dialog box. And instead, I'm gonna move my cursor over and I'm gonna hit the tab key right here and continue to click on tab until I can select this individual ceiling that's here inside of our restroom area. Now, once it's highlighted, it has the blue line going around it, click the highlight it, and select on edit type. Come up to edit next to structure, and we can see three and five eighths inch metal stud layer for the structure, and gypsum wallboard of five eighths inch thickness, as well as the total thickness showing up up here. If we wanted to add an extra layer of material, we could click the insert button. If we wanted to delete a layer of material, we could highlight it. And I'm not going to actually click it, but we could hit the delete button to get rid of the extra layer of material. If we want to put it in a different order, we could click either up or down to move it up or down on the list. In this case, the gypsum wallboard doesn't have an actual material finish showing up for it. It's showing up in gray but it doesn't have little dots indicating that this is a gyp board ceiling. And I'd like to give that to it. I'm gonna select on where it has gypsum wall and click the little button right next to it. And this will bring up the material browser. We can see gypsum wall board is highlighted. There's a cut pattern that looks like sand, but I'd really like a surface pattern that look like sand too. So where it has pattern and none, click inside of that box 
and then try to find a sand pattern. So that it shows up really nice, I'm going to pick Sand Dense. Click on OK. Now it's going to display this pattern, and the pattern is going to be black, like the little dots show up here, because the color here is black. Now, click on OK. Click on OK again, and OK. It's a little hard to see, but we can start to see those speckles showing up there on the ceiling. And if we move down to the bottom and choose Hidden Line, we can see little gray or black speckles all throughout these locations where we have a jet board ceiling in place. So to modify the materials that might be associated with our ceilings, simply either select on the ceiling or activate the ceiling command, come into edit type. I'm going to pick on edit structure. And from here, you can add, subtract materials as well as change their thicknesses. Also, you can adjust what it is they actually do. So you could tell it your structural or your finished material all through the Edit Assembly dialog box. Lights are objects that can be placed onto your ceilings and then put in position onto your ceiling grids. To place a light fixture, you need to come underneath the Architecture tab and you'll notice that there are no light tools showing up here. To place a light, you need to come underneath your components here on the Type Selector list, you'll be able to click and see if there are any lights loaded into your project. We're going to need to load in some lights into our project environment. Select on Load Family on the ribbon. It should take you to whatever your default directory is. In most cases, it's going to be the US Imperial Directory. And we're going to be looking for Lighting. Double click to open up Lighting. From here, it's broken up into two individual categories. There's going to be Architectural, and then MEP. The only difference really between architectural and MEP is that MEP has little connectors associated with it that allow you to connect wire to them. So if you want to take it back to your circuit, you can. If you're doing architectural work though, you're best served to just open up the architectural environment. You'll see external lights versus internal lights. This is inside of a building. So we're going to do internal. Here we see a variety of different lights, and if we highlight on one, and if you pick the down arrow on your keyboard, you'll be able to scroll through all these different variations of lights that come with the Revit software. Now, the one that I want to pick is going to be this Troffer Light 2x4 Parabolic. Select on Open to that. Then move your mouse over into the area where we can place this light in. What these lights will try to do is they'll try to place themselves automatically along this ceiling. Depending on what kind of light family it is, and that's what these are called, or families, some will like to be placed along the surface of a ceiling, others will like to be embedded into the ceiling. And it just comes down to what type of light they are and what it is that they're supposed to do. One thing that you'll notice is that this light fixture is right on the center of where my cursor is at. Unfortunately, that makes it pretty much impossible for me to snap to any spot along the grid. So to place this, my own trick is to come in the general area where you want it to be. In this case, I'm going to put the light right inside of this square that I'm circling myself around. But since I can't click on an intersection to place it very easily, I'm just going to click once right here. And I'm going to hit escape a couple of times to get out of the insertion command. Now select on that light fixture right on the edge will work and come up here to this command here. It's called the rotate command. For the angle, we're gonna type in 90. We're gonna rotate it around 90 degrees, then click the enter key on the keyboard. See how it spun it around 90 degrees at that time? Once the light has been highlighted and rotated around, come up here and select on, not the rotate command, but on the move command now. When you pick on move, you can pick an intersection in this case, the corner of that light fixture. And you'll also be able to move over and pick the intersection of where those two lines come together. And as a result of that, if you hit escape a couple of times, you'll now be able to place that light fixture directly on the ceiling grid where it belongs. If they happen to not be lined up exactly where you want them to be, if you select on one of the individual lines, you can either use the move command to move the grid over or you can even use the arrow keys on your keyboard to nudge it over and you'll notice that your light fixtures will follow that particular ceiling grid no matter if you nudge it up or you nudge it back down again. In this example, we have a light placed inside of one of our rooms. 
Now, once that light has already been placed, we have a couple of different options. Obviously, we want to have more lights than just this one inside of this room. So, in order to put multiple lights, we can either do the copy command, or we can do the array command. To do copy, all you need to do is select on one of the lights. Move up to the little copy icon up at the top of the screen, select on it. If you want to do more than one copy, put a check mark here in multiple. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit. Now I'm going to make some copies going over in this direction. To start, I'm going to pick the intersection of where this light hits these lines. Now I'm going to make two copies, one to here, and then another one there. And technically, I could continue this copy process on, so I could just keep going click, click, click at each intersection to drop them in. But another option that I have is to use the array command instead. I just hit escape a couple of times to get out of the command. I'm going to zoom further back in. And now I'm going to do what's considered a window around each of these three fixtures. Move your mouse to right about where my cursor is at, click, Hold the mouse button down and drag a window around those three fixtures until they highlight in blue. Then let go of your mouse. When you've done that, you'll have your three different light fixtures all highlighted. Move up here to the array command. When you pick on array, there's a couple of different options that you have. One is a radial array, but the kind that you wanna do is a linear array, which instead of a curve, it'll do a straight line. So make sure that linear is highlighted. Come over here. How many do we want in the array? We want to have a grand total of three in this array. There's two options, second or last. And either one of these in this case could actually work. Second means it's going to space them the same distance apart as between the first spot that you click and the second spot that you click. If we did last, it would evenly array them between the first spot that you clicked and then the second spot that you click. So it would space them the exact same distance apart. In this case though, I always like to use second if I can. I'm gonna pick this intersection right here, move down and then pick this intersection here. And we can see it's now arrayed them down in this direction. How many do we want in the array? I'll point out that if we change this to two and then clicked out in the space, it would only do two. If we clicked back on the two again and changed that to three, it'll now do three. So we have a fair amount of control over this array and it allows us to copy more than one simultaneously. So the different ways that you can copy or have multiple light fixtures inside of your design would be to either select on one of these individually and then use the copy command. And in this case, since we select all of these and did an array on it, I'll need to hit the tab key to select on this light then what I do, I could select on the copy command and copy it, or you could use the array command, which is select on as many as you'd like, and then select array and tell it how many rows of lights you'd like to have. One last thing to know is that whenever you use the array command, there's a good chance that they'll all be grouped together. That's the reason why we were able to click on the number two or the number three and have them all move in unison is because they're all grouped together like that. It's always best if you decide to do an array to ungroup them whenever you're done. So you know that you have the right amount of rows. So select on those groups and you can hold down the control key to select on multiple ones and then come up here to ungroup to ungroup each one of these. And you can now see as I highlight over it, they're no longer highlighting over all three of them at the same time. They're now individual light fixtures again, no longer grouped. In this exercise, we're going to load in some casework and then place the casework in our building. The first thing we need to do is figure out where's the casework going to go. And what I'd like to do is place some casework along this wall, turn the corner and come up this wall here. One thing that I'd like to do first because it might get in the way is I'm seeing this text here from our interior elevation tags. Just for right now, I'd like it to be temporarily hidden. So to do that, click somewhere up here in this white area, hold your mouse button down, and window around this elevation tag and all the text that's associated with it. When only that is highlighted, making sure you don't accidentally hit the door, let go of the button, move down to the little eyeglasses down at the bottom of the screen, and click on Hide Element. 
This will temporarily hide it. It's not permanently gone, and if you tried to print, it would still print. But just for right now, so that we can see past it when we're placing our cabinetry in, it's going to be temporarily hidden. Now, we need to start loading in some casework into this project because I know that there isn't any currently loaded. So come up here to the Architecture tab and select on Component. Now, move over and select on the Load Family button on the right-hand side of the ribbon. When you do that, you'll see a list of different folders, and we want to open up the Casework folder. From here, there's different categories, such as tall cabinets, wall cabinets. Technically, any of these could get loaded in, but what we want to do in this exercise is load in base cabinets. After going into the base cabinets folder, we'll see that there's a variety of different base cabinets that we can choose. The vanity cabinets are a little bit shorter than the base cabinets, and if you try to line them up, it gets to be a little bit difficult to have countertop going across the top of them because one's lower than the other. So let's take the base cabinet corner unit angle as being one of those that we want to load in. Also, I know that a sink will ultimately go in here. So if you hold down the control key on the keyboard, you can click on double door sink unit. And we'll now load this one into our project. And for some of the other base cabinets, single door and drawer will work pretty well. And I'd also like this one that has the four drawers. Keep holding down the control key and click on that one as well. Once you have these four different types of cabinets in here, move down to the bottom and click on open. And this will load all four of those in. Move over here to your properties and take a look at the different ones that are loaded in. And if you select here on the picture and the type selector list, you'll see all those different cabinets that we just tried to load in. Now the one that we definitely know where it's going to be located at is going to be the corner one because it's going to be at the corner of these two walls. So that's going to be the best spot to start. Move down where it has the base cabinet corner, select on the 36 inch. And now a secret to this is before you even click, hit the space bar on your keyboard. When you do that, you'll see that it'll rotate your component around to be in whatever direction you need it to be in. And when you see those two walls turn blue, that's where you want to click. We've now placed that corner cabinet there into the corner of our room. Now this is showing up as being dashed for a couple of reasons. One is because inside of the family, it's actually drawn out as being dashed in a plan view. The other reason is ultimately there will be a countertop put on top of this. So when the countertop is put on top of it, it would be hidden underneath the countertop. Now let's change to a different kind of family. Here we have the double door sink unit a little bit lower down. That's the one that I actually want. Let's pick the big boy, the 48 inch one. Hit the space bar again. When it looks like your cursor is in the same direction as the wall, that's exactly where you want it to be. And then just line these two up and then click to place. Now I want to put at least one cabinet over here and at least one cabinet over here. I'm personally going to put in a 24 inch single door and drawer cabinet in this location here. In fact, I'm going to put two of them together side by side. And I'm going to see what the other cabinet is that we have up here, the four drawer. I'm going to select on that, spin it around, and put it in place. You can hit escape a couple times on the keyboard to get out of the command. And now finally, I always like to look at my cabinets before I just accept them as being in there in the way that we like them. Because depending on how they're made, you want to make sure that the drawers aren't getting slammed against the wall instead of out into the room area. To do that, come underneath the view tab, over here to 3D view, and we're going to place a camera inside of this room. Somewhere over here near this dimension, click once, make this cone come way out into here. Whenever your cursor is somewhere into this next room, click in order to be able to place this. And when you're done, you'll be able to see the ceilings, the walls, as well as the casework that makes this view up. Also, if you want to see a little bit lower down, you can click on the little dots that show up there and drag it down. If for some reason you can't see the ceiling or you want to see less of the ceiling, you can click on the little control dot and either drag it down or drag it up in order to be able to see more of your casework. We currently have casework that's wrapping around the corner between these two walls. The only thing is though, as we can see, it doesn't have a countertop sitting on top. So let's go through the process of loading in a countertop as well as placing it here in our view. Our best bet though will be to begin by going into our first floor floor plan. And the reason is, is that placing countertop is just a lot easier to do if you're looking straight down at it. 
Move up here to the Architecture tab and select on Component. Move your mouse over and then select on Load Family. Now the kind of family we want to load in will be a countertop family. And it doesn't show up here on the list, but it's located underneath Casework. So double click on Casework and here we'll see a countertops folder. Double click there and we want to load in the countertop L-shaped with sinkhole 2. Select on that, we'll see an L-shaped countertop, and that's exactly the shape that we need to place in our project. Click on Open. You'll see it following your cursor around. Now what you'll need to do is hit the space bar in order to rotate this around until it's the shape that you want it to be. Or in other words, it's going in the same direction as what this casework underneath is going. Zoom into the corner, and then click to place it when you see those two blue lines there. If for some reason all you're seeing is dark and thick lines and you're not seeing the two blue lines like we just had, what you can do is come up to the View tab and then click on this button right here that says Thin Lines. So if you have dark lines like that and you want to see those individual thin lines, it's View and Thin Lines to see that level of detail. Now if we zoom back out again, unfortunately because of the dimensions of our casework down below, the countertop currently isn't covering the entire thing. To adjust this, select on the countertop. You'll notice that there's this option right here. Click on the arrows and hold down, and then just drag it out, and then let go when you get out to the end. And do the same thing up here at the top. When you've done that, it should now cover this pretty well. The next thing we'll want to do is take a look at this from a camera view and make sure that it's at the right elevation. To do that, we're going to come down here on our list and we're going to double click on 3D View 4. That's our camera view for this room. And here we can see we have the countertop with the sinkhole in there and it's going around the corner. So the place countertop, the first thing you may need to do is just load it into your project. But after that, go into a plan view, click at the intersection of wherever you'd like that to begin at, and then you may need to adjust it, but at that point it's a matter of just selecting on the counter and in plan view, you can drag the ends until they're in the right locations. In this exercise, we're going to load in some sinks. Now, sinks are considered component families, just like such things as water closets, bathtubs, pieces of furniture. If you can master putting a sink into your project, you can put in just about any of those typical kinds of component families into your project environment. In this case, we really want to load in two sinks. One's going to be a sink that goes into each one of our different bathroom areas. We're also going to have a sink that'll be a kitchen sink that'll come into here in what more than likely be a break room area. To begin, let's zoom in on this part of our building. Now we need to load in some of those sinks. We can do that by coming underneath Architecture, selecting on Component, moving over to Load Family, scrolling down until we see Plumbing because these are plumbing fixtures, going into the architectural folder, and then double clicking where it has fixtures. From here, we have a variety of different kinds of component families, showers and drinking fountains, but the ones of course that we want to load in are gonna be sinks. So double click on sinks. From here, there's gonna be two different ones that we want to load in. Now the first one is going to be the sink double. And this is gonna fit there in that break room area, right in this location. The next will be one of these down here, and it's probably going to be the Sync Single 2D. Let's just check on it to verify. That'll work okay in this condition. Now, the keyword here is 2D. This is actually a two-dimensional sink. Now, let's go through the process of loading this in, and then I'll describe why we think about using a two-dimensional sink. Hold down the Control key, and then click on the Sync Kitchen Double. And if Sync Single 2D isn't already highlighted, hold down your Control key and click on that too. Click on Open to load these in. Now the reason why we might have a two-dimensional sink, and that's what I'm looking at here in the preview underneath our properties, is that two-dimensional sinks take up a lot less space in Revit as far as file size is concerned or processing power is concerned within the Revit environment. So if you have a lot of different kinds of objects, particularly on larger projects, what you'll find is that putting two-dimensional components in instead of three-dimensional components will sometimes make the model less heavy, which means it'll be a faster project if you do it that way. 
you'll also discover that the way that it looks inside of a plane view won't be any different. So whether it's a two-dimensional sink or a three-dimensional sink, if you're looking straight down at it, you'll never be able to tell the difference between the two. So as a result of that, unless you absolutely need to see it in 3D, it's actually usually better to insert in two-dimensional components. They'll schedule the same way instead of three-dimensional components just because it's easier for Revit to process. So in this example, let's make sure that we use the Sync Single 2D. Move in here to our restroom area. And I'm just gonna put a couple of wall-mounted ones here. And put a couple of wall-mounted ones over on the other side. And then hit Escape whenever you're done. I'm gonna come over here and we're gonna place a sink into this sink hole. Now I do have a little minor design issue here that I don't like. I'm looking at this countertop and I'm seeing a hole right here and it's not centered on the casework underneath. So I'm gonna select on the countertop first. Depending on the countertop, in some conditions you might have arrows that would allow you to drag the hole over to the right location. But since this does not have the arrows associated with this opening, we need to look underneath the properties of this particular countertop to move it over. Here I can see that the sink location is three foot three. Change that to be five foot, and then move your mouse over into this direction. I can see that's over a little bit too far. So we're gonna change this to be four foot now and move our mouse over in this location. And we can see that it shifted it up and then shifted it back down again. So now this is more centered inside of this cabinetry or this piece of casework that's underneath. Now that we've done that and we know that the hole is in the right location, let's place the sink in there. To do that, come underneath the Architecture tab again, select on Component, and in this case, I don't want that 2D sink. I want the Sink Kitchen Double, which is 42 by 21. Come over in this direction. You can hit the space bar to rotate it around, and now I'm gonna to try to place this right in this area. I can already see that the sink hole isn't gonna be big enough, but that's okay. We can adjust it after the fact. Click in order to place that right in that location. Technically, we wouldn't even need to adjust that hole for the sink if we didn't need to. The only reason why we might actually adjust it is because in this case, the hole for where the sink is gonna be sitting is really only that big and you'd only see that in a 3D view. But let's take the time to make that adjustment. So if you select there on the countertop, I'm gonna scroll down here, and I can see that there's a couple of different dimensions here related to the sink opening, including the depth and the width. So that's gonna be the overall dimensions of this particular opening. Well, I'm gonna assume that since it's one foot three is the depth that's going to go from here to here, and that looks about right, so it's really the width that needs to be adjusted. Now, I'm not sure the exact width this is gonna to need to be. So I'm gonna change this to be three foot, just for starters, and see how big that three foot dimension looks. It's close. I'm now gonna do three foot three. Take another look at it. That's just about right. The only problem is now is that the hole there for where the sink is at needs to now be moved down again. So once again, we're going to change the location for this. And in this case, I'll type in three foot six just to see what the difference is. And we can see that now that opening is just perfect for where those sink basins need to go. This process that we just did is not just for such things as sinks. Pretty much anything that would be considered a component family would get placed in in this way. There's nothing wrong with 2D if you only need to see it two-dimensional in that specific view. In the case of a plan view, if this is going to be the only spot I would ever see these sinks, then loading in two-dimensional sinks is fine because it'll show up and document appropriately. And finally, if we're going to place a three-dimensional sink into the plan, make sure to choose a three-dimensional sink, then shift it to place it in the appropriate location. In this lesson, we'll learn how to place a staircase in our building model. To begin, we need to zoom in where the staircase is going to be. And in this case, it's going to be inside of this space right over here. So, zoom into this area so it's roughly in the center of your screen. Now, come underneath the Architecture tab, and we're going to find the Stair command right above the word Circulation. After selecting on the Stair command, I want to point out that underneath Properties here on the Type Selector list, it's currently a 7-inch max riser 11-inch tread staircase. If we select on the Type Selector list, we'll see there's actually three different kinds of staircases currently loaded into this project. Now you can create your own staircases with their own set of properties, but the important thing to remember here is that this assembled staircase, each riser can only be seven inches high. 
and the treads are all going to be 11 inches deep. Also, when we start to draw, we're currently on the first floor. The base level is going to be on level 1, which is the first floor level. And the staircase knows it's going to go up to level 2. If the staircase should have went up to a different level, we could have selected in here and pulled off of the list a different level. But in this case, level 2 works just fine for us. Now let's start the process of drawing. We'll see that here along the options bar, there's a location line. And one of these options here is run center. Well, what this means is, is if we start drawing right now, it's going to start drawing the staircase, but it's going to be centered on the area that we draw in. And I don't really want to draw the staircase right down the center of the staircase. This is a fairly tight area. So as a result of that, I'd like to draw this staircase from one of the edges of the staircase. To do that, I'm going to come underneath the location line and change this run center to be exterior support right. This will take us to the far right hand side of our staircase. The actual run width, this is how wide our staircase will be. I'm just going to tell this to be a 3 foot 6 inch wide staircase. And it will automatically insert a landing in when we draw it in. One last thing to take a look at is up here going across the top. Make sure that you have run highlighted and that straight is the option that's currently highlighted. You can do a variety of other kinds of staircases including a spiral staircase these L-shaped staircases. Now when you see the L's and the ones that turn back on themselves, these are ones that do that shape without a landing. But the kind of staircase we're doing will have a landing, and that's the reason why we've chosen not to choose one of these two types. Coming to the drawing area, in the exact location we might modify after the fact, but just click roughly the middle location right along the edge of this wall. Start to draw up. And as you do this, you'll see treads being added, risers being added. We can also see that down at the bottom of the staircase, it's given us a count of how many risers have been created and how many risers are still left to be created. And it knows this based on the maximum rise as well as the level to level heights. Change this to be nine and nine, so nine risers created, nine remaining, and then click. Next, move over here and roughly lined up with the other staircase, click again and then come straight down. You'll see it's tried to automatically add a landing there, there in the middle. And I'm not being really accurate when I click, so you don't have to click necessarily where you see the last tread. You can click somewhere out here in space and that will finish up your staircase. Once the staircase has been drawn in place like this, click on the big green check mark. And then it will draw in that staircase. Let's take a better look at what this staircase actually looks like by putting a camera inside of this space and taking a photo in this direction. To do that, you just come underneath the View tab, move over here to the Words 3D View, and then pick Camera off of the list. Stand just inside of the doorway here by clicking, point the camera in this direction, and then click. When you do this, you'll now have a nice picture of what the inside of this staircase looks like. If you want to adjust the width of this so you can see more of it, just click on these dots and pull these dots up or to the side. This area right here, by the way, is where the second floor starts. And we can see that the opening that makes up this space is currently a little bit too big because the staircase is not currently attaching itself to the floor. But we can always come back in there later and clean up that condition. But as you can see, in order to place a staircase inside of a space, and I'm going to go into a plan view to show this. You'll select on the architecture tab, choose the stair command off of the list, make sure to pick your location point so that it's in the right spot. When we first had it, it said center, and that would have drawn that outline straight down the center of the staircase. Instead, we picked exterior support right, which meant that we could specify where the outer walls were at and then draw it down in this direction and also specify the width of the staircase so that it will fit appropriately inside of the space. Opening objects are objects that create openings in floors, ceilings, and roofs. Earlier on, when we were first designing our floors, we put an opening object in this space here so that we'd have a location to eventually put our staircase into. Now that our staircase is here, we need to make an adjustment to this opening object so that the hole doesn't show up right here. In fact, we want the edge of our floor 
to be right up here, right at the edge of the staircase, so you can make the smooth transition from the landing, down the staircase, down to the lower level. To do that, we need to highlight on the edge of the opening. When you click on it, it'll all turn blue. Then come up to Edit Sketch. When you do this, you'll get these pink, purple, magenta lines going all the way around the area where that opening is located at. Now this opening goes from the first floor all the way up through level three. So we have a nice big staircase area. Now when we make this adjustment by clicking on this line and pulling it on up right to the edge of the staircase and then let go. When we made that adjustment, it's not only made a hole here or an opening here on level two, but because this opening object goes up through level three, we have now created an opening that also goes up through our third floor level up above. Now that this is the shape that we want it to be, click on the big green check mark. We can see that the floor is now added material and it's coming all the way over right to the edge of where this opening object is at. If you click out in space, we can see that the blue goes away. Now we're still gonna need to add some railing here so people don't fall off the edge and go right into the hole. And if you need to modify an opening object, it's just a matter of selecting on the object, coming up to edit sketch, and then editing where the perimeter of that opening should be. And then from there on out, click the big green check mark, and then every floor that opening goes through will now have a hole for your staircase to rise up through. In this exercise, we're gonna learn how to create railing in a project. This particular project doesn't really have the need for a straight run of railing. But what it does have is it already has some railing showing up here on our staircase. We're going to create an example of just a straight line of railing. And we're going to do that on the outside of the building so that you can see the process of how to do it. We'll also modify this existing railing so that it comes over and then comes back across so that nobody comes around and just falls into this hole here that's been created by the staircase and the opening. So to begin with, let's start by drawing a piece of railing just outside of our building. Ultimately, we will get rid of it, but this will give us a good feel for the process of drawing a railing. Underneath the Architecture tab, we're going to select on Railing. You'll see under Properties that this is a handrail rectangular. And when we start to draw where we want the handrail to go, whatever the length of that line is that we get ready to draw, this handrail will be that exact length, and it'll be whatever that shape is as well. In this instance, let's draw a handrail out here on the outside of the building. Make sure with your drawing tools that it's a straight line. You can also draw a rail that happens to be curved, that's circular, that can be pretty much any shape that you want it to be. But for this example, we're just gonna do a straight line. Click once somewhere out here. Now this is up on the second level, so this is gonna look like it's floating in space here in a moment, but that's okay. Click over here, click the endpoint, and then click again. What we've done is we've drawn two lines and the railing is gonna follow the line from this point to the corner and then wrap the corner and come back down. Click the big green check mark and then move up to your 3D icon so we can take a look at it in 3D. You'll see there's the railing that we just drew from the end point around, wraps around the corner and comes back. That's the basics behind drawing a railing. It's just a matter of selecting the railing command, picking the type of railing that you want off of the list then drawing the path that you want the railing to follow. Now, if you want to make modifications to an existing railing, this is how you do it. We're going to select on this railing and we're just going to delete it for right now. And we're going to work on a railing that already exists in our project. And this is a railing that was created when our staircases were created. So to get to there, we need to come back to our level one floor plan view. So just double click on level one. You'll begin to see that the railing in this instance is actually showing up as being a dashed line, at least through the majority of this. And now technically we can edit the railing from here, but I'd really like to edit it up on our level two. So just double click here on level two, and we can see that same railing, if we zoom in here on the top, coming around on level two. Right here is where our opening is. This is the top of our staircase, and you'd walk down the stairs in this direction. What I want to do is add another piece of railing that comes up to here, and comes back across. To add the railing, instead of just drawing it in like we did in the previous example, select on the already existing railing. This railing was automatically created when the staircase was created. And then pick on Edit Path. This is the same process as if we'd wanted to modify the path that the railing that we had just done in the previous steps. 
we could have selected on that railing, clicked on Edit Path, and then redrawn any of those lines that made up the path, and then the railing would have followed that path instead. This next part is key. Something you may have learned from Revit already is the ability to select on a line and then drag the line out by clicking on the grips. The problem is, is if you do that with a railing that's sloping down, like this one is, going down a staircase, it'll continue its slope on up if you drag it out in this direction. We don't want it to continue the slope. So to do that, we need to draw in another piece of line from here and draw this four inches down, click the endpoint of that line, and come straight over and hit escape a couple of times to get out of that part of the command. What this has done is instead of continuing the slope that's going down the staircase, it's now going to be flat or flush in this direction and then come straight on across. If we click the big green check mark at this point, just click somewhere out in here, we can start to see that that's what's happening. We can see the shade along here as opposed to what it looks like as it's sloping down. And we can also view this by placing a camera inside of here by coming up to view, then clicking on 3D view, and then picking on camera. Click where we want to stand with the camera, and then use this cone and click somewhere in here, making sure that the staircase is completely inside of this cone of lines. We can see that this railing effect did go flat right at the end, and then it's moved across. And if you click on this little control dot, and then drag down, we can see that entire railing that we just put in. So the magic behind doing railings is either executing the railing command or selecting on the piece of railing. Then drawing in the path that you'd like that railing to follow, and the path will automatically follow that all the way on around no matter where you draw it to. In this exercise, we're going to review the different properties that make up a staircase. To understand this a little bit better, we need to activate the staircase command from underneath the architecture tab, and then select on stair. When you do this, we'll see there's a type selector list underneath properties. And if you pick on that type selector list, we'll see that there's an assembled stair, a cast in place stair, as well as a precast stair. Now you can make your own staircases, that's not a problem, but they're gonna fit underneath one of these three different types of categories. Now I'm going to click just out here and now select on edit type. By doing this, we'll go into the type properties, which means the properties of the assembled staircase. We can see that there are supports, such as strainers on the right and left hand side, and whether or not they're going to be closed strainers, open strainers, or not have any strainers at all. This area under type properties also has a middle support. So if we'd put a check mark in there, we could specify that carriage, that strainer that's going straight up the center of the staircase and how many of them there needs to be. There's a cut mark type option here. So you can specify if in plain view, you want a line going through the staircase indicating that above this line that the staircase should become a dash line. This is where you specify the way that line would look. There's also some hidden properties in here and run type has that hidden property. It says two inch tread, one inch nosing, quarter inch riser. It's trying to indicate that this is what the construction of the tread is gonna look like. That being said, if you click inside of the box and if you pick on the little button, you'll see extra properties associated with your tread and risers, including what materials are they gonna be made out of? Will there be a tread? Will there be a riser? If these boxes are not checked, then it simply will not have those entities there. I would think in most cases you'll probably have a tread, but there will be conditions where you might want to have an open staircase where you may not have any risers. You can choose the nosing profile. The nosing profile allows you to control the way that the staircase looks. So in the case of a tread, it isn't just the edge of what that tread will look like. It can be what the entire tread would look like. The riser properties can be found underneath there, and we can click on OK to this. So that was underneath the run type. And the different supports that make up this staircase are showed here. I also want to point out that there is underneath family, system family cast in place and precast stair. These are different styles of staircases. Some of the properties will be related to these. For instance, in the case of cast in place stair, this would be the kind of staircase that would be just poured on site. The entire staircase is made out of concrete. 
and what properties would you like to have that style of staircase to have? Ultimately, if you want to be able to come in and adjust your staircase properties, execute the staircase command, be sure to click on the edit type button underneath properties, and through here in the type properties dialog box, you can make changes and edit just about all the properties associated with the staircase. The railings we see here are all railings that come with Revit 2014. If we zoom in to take a look at these different railings, you'll see that this one is made up of a bunch of glass panels. It also has some railings going maybe across the top. Here we have some individual balusters as well as a handrail and then the top. Here we have a group of railings as well as some balusters that are standing straight up. And that's how these individual railings are made. If we select any of these railings, in this case, I'm going to select on the glass panel bottom fill, we can go to edit type to see some of their properties. A few of the properties that we need to look at begin with the top rail. That's this particular bar that's going all the way across the top. For this one, it's three foot tall off of the ground. It also has elliptical one and a half by one and one eighth for the type. Now what this indicates is that there's an elliptical shape that has those dimensions and it's being swept the length of whatever the railing is. I'm going to go back into the properties by selecting on the railing and edit type. So that's what this is right here. If there's a handrail, oftentimes you'll see that handrail information here on the list. Other times that handrail information will be underneath rail structure. And if you click edit to that, in this case, we can see there are two rails. One is two foot eight inches off the ground. The other is two foot four inches off of the ground. And they're both one inch square. And those are these two rails that we see here. I'm gonna click on okay. Now, so far what we haven't seen is what makes up these panels. Well, what makes up the panels is if we select on edit type one more time, and go into baluster placement and select on edit. Each of these panels are considered their own individual baluster, whether it be the steel frame or the glass panel, which is two feet by eight feet. That particular family, which is a family just like a table would be or a sink would be, gets repeated again and again and again along the length of this particular railing structure. And some of the distances in between them are controlled through over here. There is also the start post, corner post, and end post for these. And if I click cancel just to get out of this menu so we can see it, and I'm gonna pull my type properties over, this is one of those corner posts. And this is gonna be repeated at the start, as well as any time that this has a corner, this post will now show up. So let's take a look at these properties again on some of these other railings. I'm gonna click on okay to this, and zoom back out, select on this rail here, and then click on edit type. What we have three foot six high is the top of this rail and it's a rectangle. It's two inches by two inches. There's also a handrail in this case positioned on the left hand side that's circular in one and a half inches around. We go to the baluster placement and click on edit. We'll see that every four inches it's supposed to repeat this baluster square family again and again and again. I'm going to click on cancel the both of those menus to get out and now select on this last railing and pick on edit type. If we take a look underneath the baluster placement in this case and select on edit, we can see that there's a baluster round as well as baluster round all the way on down. These are going to be put into place every four feet on center or at the start, corner, or ends of wherever this railing condition is at. And we can see there's one of those balusters right there and every four feet they're being drawn in. Now I'm gonna hit on cancel to get out of this menu. I'm gonna come up to edit next to rail structure. And here we can see each of these rails going straight up as well as their height off of the ground and their overall one inch diameter around. This is the shape and this is their height. As far as materials go, it's currently listed as being by category but if someone would click inside there, you could specify that this is made out of stainless steel, aluminum, PVC, whatever material you like to be made out of, just specify it through here and in the materials. 
So railings, they're made up of rails as well as balusters. They also have top rails and handrails associated with them. And all their properties can be found from underneath Edit Type in the Properties dialog box. In this exercise, we're going to learn how to create a site for our building complex. To do this, we first need to come underneath Site in our Project Browser. Under Floor Plans, we're going to open up the Site View. From here, we can zoom out so we can see the outer extents of where we may draw our site to. Now we need to use the Site Tools, or in particular the Topo Surface Tool, to draw in where our site is going to be located at. To do this, come underneath the Massing and Site tab and pick on Topo Surface. Where it says Elevation, let's give this an elevation of 3 feet. And the first spot that we're going to pick is going to be in the upper left hand side of the screen. Pick another spot straight across from that previous spot that you picked, but in the upper right hand side of your screen. For the next elevation, make this be a much smaller number. In this case, we're going to do negative 4 feet. Click somewhere right in this general location. What it's done is it's automatically created our different contour lines from this elevation down to this elevation. Click again down over in this area and we can see it continuing the creator site and the contour lines that are associated with that. As for the elevation I like to have around the building, let's make this be negative 8 inches. Pick each of the corners that are going around our building. By doing this, those spots are at negative 8 inches. You can start to see that this is sort of going around our buildings now instead of going directly through the buildings. And it's all starting to flow down and in this direction. So if any water starts to fall due to rain or whatever the case may be, it's going to start to flow toward and then ultimately around our building down toward this portion of the site. Now that we've done that, click on the big green check mark to finish that off. Come up here to the top and click on the little house icon, the 3D view command. Here's the site with its contours. If we move down here to the visual styles, we can even turn on shaded to start to see some color. You can spin your model around by holding down the shift key as well as the wheel on the mouse to see how it's sloping down. Our building is currently sitting right there on the site. So we were able to create this topo surface, also known as a site, by coming up here on the massing and site tab and then picking on topo surface and picking each of these points and setting the appropriate elevations for each of those point locations. One of the things we may wish to enter on a site plan will be to put trees and plants somewhere on the site. To do that, underneath the Massing and Site tab, we can find there's an option there for Site Components. Select on Site Component, look underneath Properties, and here we can see that there's a variety of different types of shrubs, plants, and trees that we can place inside of our Revit project. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look here on the list, I'm going to select Red Maple down toward the bottom, and I'm going to pick a few spots where I want to have some red maple trees. I'll put one over here close to my building so we can see it pretty easily. And a few more over here so maybe it's kind of a nice little wooded area. Let's put a few plants or shrubs next to the building. Just sort of go through here and pick ones that you might like to place. I'm going to pick this tiny little Japanese fern. And you can see how the scale is different depending on the plant that you place. I'll put just a few more in here on the site. Also, put a few shrubs in and put a few of those in these locations. One of the things that you can see is depending on the type of plant that it is, it'll have a different symbol for different types of plants. The interesting thing is though, is that if it comes time to render these plants, they will all render as the type of plant that they actually are. Now, let's take a look at this inside of a 3D view. Now, we can either come up to 3D, or we have a camera currently outside of our building that should enable us to see what this looks like. Double click on 3D view 1. Here, we can see the different plantings that are at the outside of our building. The little bushes, the big tree here in the background. If we want to expand this view out, we can select on the box going around the outside of the view, 
click on the control button and pull it out slightly. Same way here, pull it out slightly to see what our building looks like with these bushes and trees. Now the most interesting thing about these kind of objects is that they're not hosted directly to a level. They're actually hosted to the site. So if the site slopes down, each of the trees, each of the bushes will come in at the appropriate height to be able to sit at the site at that elevation. So to place trees, bushes around the outside of your building, simply come up to massing and site and then choose your site components and place them anywhere you need them around your building. Rooms carry a lot of information, such as the amount of square footage that's inside of that space, the finish material of the walls, the floors, the ceilings, information related to the room number and the room name. Let's go through the process of placing some rooms inside of our space. To do this, come underneath the architecture tab and then find room on the ribbon. Select on the room command. And then when you get inside of any of these rooms, you'll see the walls highlight right in those areas. What's going on is that the room will automatically expand out and take on the shape of whichever room that it's currently in. What I'd like to do in this case is put a tag in a room just right inside of this little box right here. And I'd like to do another one that takes up the big area. So click right there. Hit escape a couple of times to get out of the command. Now zoom in here to where we have room one. Ultimately, this is just gonna be an elevator pit or an elevator shaft. Realistically, we may or may not have to label this, but I do wanna call it something. So I'm gonna click on the tag, then click on the word room and call it E-L-E-V. So it stands for elevator. Here we have our room two. Click on that tag. And now let's change this to be entry. I'm gonna leave it as being the number two, but if I had wanted to change that number, it would just be a matter of clicking on the tag, clicking on the number, and then typing in the information we'd want it to say. There's another way that we can go about doing this, and it's actually my favorite way to do it. You can either click out here in space or hit escape to make sure that you're out of the command. My favorite way is to come over here underneath schedules and quantities, and then double click where we have a room finish schedule set up. There'll be an option midway through here that says insert above the word rows. Insert in a data row. Do this three or four times. We can see we have ELEV and that's the name of our first room. There's an entry level room here and we can already see the square footage of each of those spaces. So the second that we were dropping these into the spaces, it was filling in the information on the room finish schedule. Now, the next thing I'd like to do, name this one here and just call it office. The fourth one, I'm going to call break for break room. This one is going to be men's. This one women's. These are the restrooms. And this is going to be stair. For right now, I'm going to leave these numbers just the way that they are. And I'm just going to click in one of the cells just so that that ends up finishing off the stair command there. Now that each of these have been put in, come back to the architecture tab, then come up here to the top on the project browser and double click where it says level one. Underneath the architecture tab, we now are gonna place another room. Before we click, I'm gonna point out something new. There's an option here that says room and new. Click that. Here we have a list of all those rooms that we just set up. As a result of this, we can click on three office and place it in the area where the office is at. We can click here, click where the break room is. Wait a second, if we try to place a break room in here, this is gonna give us a problem because I only want the break room to come into this area right here. Let's hit escape for right now and we'll come back and try to address this situation in just a minute. Select on five men's and then just put it in one of these restroom areas. I'm gonna click the X to that. The women's room, I'm gonna place it there. I'm gonna hit escape a couple of times now to get out of that command. Now, we still have this room right here. Well, it's not actually a room because we haven't placed it yet, but we want it to be a room. To accomplish this, once again, underneath this room and area, there's an option up here that says room separator. If we select on room separator, pick this intersection. 
and then draw a line all the way across and click. Now if you move your mouse around this area, one of the things you'll see is if you cross over any place there's an X, that indicates that's where the room is at. If I click on it to highlight it, we can see that that line that we drew, a room separator line, has now stopped this entry level room from going into this space. And as a result of that, we can once again come up here to the architecture tab, pick on the room command, and then pick break off of the list, and then place it right inside the break room area. And finally, pick steer off of the list and click to make this be our stairwell area. So by going through this method, we were able to predefine all the different rooms and then place them in the correct locations. So there's two different ways to drop rooms in. The first way is to just come underneath architecture, select up here, and then tell it, I want a room here, 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 and here, just by clicking. The other way is to go into your room finish schedule, set up all those rooms in advance, then you can just pick them off of the list and then place them in order wherever you'd like to be able to place them. Room objects in Revit have a variety of properties associated with them. And we can see some of those properties if we zoom in and then find one of these rooms that we've placed inside of our space. In this case, we have Entry 2. And I'm going to move my mouse until I see that X crossing through Entry 2. Click when you see that X and you'll be able to see the entire room highlighted in blue. Underneath Properties, you'll then see that this room is hosted on Level 1. Currently, it has what's called a limit offset of 10 feet, meaning this room is currently 10 feet high. Scroll down on the list. These materials and finishes are materials and finishes that I entered in for a previous exercise. That's the reason why they're in there now. Dimensions show the total area. It also will give information related to the perimeter and cubic feet. This is where such things as the room number as well as the room name reside. The tag is actually a dumb object. It gets its information from the number and the name that shows up here in the room object. And there are some default wall, floor, ceiling, base finish categories that can be manually entered in that just come with these room objects to begin with. One of the properties that I wanted to point out up here where we have dimensions. And right now we can see that there's a volume listed here and it has X number of cubic feet. If yours has that, great. If it doesn't have that, this is the reason why it doesn't have that. I'm going to come underneath the architecture tab here, move over here to room and area and click on the words room and area. In fact, anytime you see the words with the little down arrow next to it, select on area and volume computations and make sure that areas and volumes has a dot in it. If only areas is, then you would not see any information showing up as far as what the total volume would be. So put a dot there and then click on OK. When you do that, and you're selecting on the room, you'll then see the total volume for that room. But there's one other thing that we need to make sure of. If we double click right here, and this is the section that's going through our entry level, currently we can't see the room objects inside of this view. In fact, it'd be very hard to even accidentally hit on one of these room objects by just moving through the room. But what we can do is we can go into what's called visibility graphics to see it. If you move over here and on the properties, it says visibility graphics and click the big gray edit button. Scroll down on the list and we're looking for the word rooms. It's all alphabetical, so we're just looking for the R's. Expand out the little plus next to that and then put a check next to interior fill and reference and click on OK. We can now see the interior fill color as well as this X, consider the reference lines for this room. Now we can highlight on where that X is at, click and see the properties for this space. Even though the room says that it's 10 feet tall and we can see the limit offset right here, it's not actually taking its volume all the way up to the 10 foot mark. What happens is floors, ceilings, and walls are all objects which are called room bounding objects. What this means is that up to a 10 foot elevation, this room can give you its correct amount of cubic feet of volume. Because it's only going up to the ceiling, we can see that the cubic feet here of volume is going to be 22,435 cubic feet. 
If we click where the double arrow is here and drag this down, now the cubic feet is lower than the ceiling, and we can see that the total volume is now smaller. So Revit's rooms have some extra controls associated with them. And I'm just gonna select back on the room and drag this back up, and we'll see it automatically gets bound by that ceiling. And some of the properties that are gonna be associated with these rooms include the total area, the total cubic feet, as well as information related to the materials of the walls and the name and number of that space that we're currently looking at. When we placed our rooms in the model, we did this on level one. And when we did that, it automatically tagged each of these rooms upon placement. Now that's good for us on level one. But the thing about room tags is that they only show up in the view that you place them in. So if we take a look up here at our duplicate view, we'll see that these rooms are there. And if we move our mouse around, we'll be able to see them highlight, but the room tags are not here. And the reasoning is, is that tags only show up in the view that you place them in. And we place them in level one. In this instance though, maybe we want to have those room tags inside of this space. To get those room tags back, the easiest way for us to do that is it come underneath the annotate tab on the ribbon, move down and select on tag all. The one that I want to put in this room, room tags, room tag with area and click on OK. And it will automatically tag each and every one of these inside of their individual rooms. Now, if you have a condition like this where the tag is covering up some other information, simply select on the tag. You'll see some arrows down here and then click and drag those arrows up and the tag will go along with it. Now that room tag is away from this elevation tag and it's no longer covering any other information up. To place these tags after the fact in other views or in your original view if for some reason one of them got deleted, you can always come up to annotate and choose tag all, select the appropriate tag off of the list and have it generate those tags through all those empty rooms throughout your project. In this exercise, we're going to prepare our scene to get it ready for a rendering. The first thing we need to consider is where do we want to stand with our camera? Technically, we could do an interior rendering. The only thing is though, is inside of this project, we've only placed lights in one room. So realistically, there's just not enough light inside of this space to be able to generate a very realistic or nice rendering. Since there's not really enough light on the interior of our building, Let's take an exterior shot of our building. We'll also take a picture of that other building that's out here to the side of our main building. We'll call it an outbuilding or a garage. And let's try to get some of those trees into the shot. We could place a camera in here, but we'd be better served since we're going to be taking a picture basically of the site to do this from the site view. So floor plans and site. The next thing we want to do is come underneath the view tab and select on the words 3D view because underneath the words 3D view, there's an option to place a camera. Click on the camera, make sure it says level one, and then offset five foot six. This means we'll be standing at the same elevation as level one, and we'll be holding the camera five foot six inches off of the ground. Move over here and click somewhere in this general area where I'm getting ready to click with this little camera icon. When you do, move over in this direction and try to get as much of your buildings inside of this blue cone as possible. If you can't get them all in, that's okay. We can make adjustments after the fact. The next spot you need to click will be somewhere out here and make sure that your cursor is just beyond where these trees are located at so we can get as many of the trees in the shot as possible and click. When you do, you should see a shot very similar to this and it's created a new 3D view that we're gonna do our rendering for. Now, in this case, I'm seeing a lot of sight and maybe not everything is centered just the way that I like it. So you can click on any of these control buttons and then drag them from one spot to another. If you wanted to see just a touch more sky, you can raise it up or less sky. You can lower it down whenever you get it just the way that you like it. Zoom in and try to get as much of that scene on your screen. Now we're almost ready to go through the rendering process. But before we're really ready to do a rendering, I usually like to do two things. Come down here to this button that says visual style and change this to be shaded. This will show us where all the shade is coming down. 
this is going to be a very good camera angle for us. In this case, I'm seeing light showing into the building. I'm seeing light coming down and hitting the face of this part of our building. I think that that could make for a fairly dynamic rendering, so I like that. So the next thing is, is to go back down to that button again, click on realistic. When you do realistic, it may take it a few seconds to process depending on the strength of your computer, but you'll then be able to see each of these plants that'll give you a little bit of feedback whether or not you need to swap out these plants with different species of plant that might look different. Also, it'll tell you whether or not this is the right color of materials as far as the glass, in this case, on the curtain wall or the brick on the outside of our building here. When you get to that point where you have everything set up the way that you'd like to see it, then you're going to be ready for that rendering process. Once we have our camera view, the next step is to do a rendering of this view. To accomplish this, down at the bottom of the screen, there's a small teapot icon and it's called Show Rendering Dialog Box. Click on that little teapot. When you do, the rendering dialog box will come up on the screen. The first thing that we should know about is quality. Draft quality is the lowest quality, but it's also the fastest way to go about rendering. If you have any concerns as far as what your materials are going to look like, draft is often the best way to go because it'll show you a really quick, grainy, but good representation of how your materials are going to look. Some of the other settings that are there are low, medium, high, and best. Usually low and medium don't take very long to do. Once you get up to high, you have to start thinking about how much time it might take. Best, I've seen renderings in best take as little as two hours. I've seen them take as long as 16 hours, depending on how many light sources are in the project. So usually I recommend rendering at some of the lower settings first, and then if you need something better than that, Give yourself plenty of time and then pick one of the better settings off the list. For this example, I'm going to select on medium. Coming down, we can see that there's lighting options. Right now, this exterior sun only will work really good for this scene. It's only going to use the sun in the sky to illuminate what it is we're getting ready to render. I will point out though that there are exterior sun and artificial as well as exterior artificial. Anything with artificial is going to be any lights that you've personally have added to the scene. Right now, we've only added a few lights to this project in one room here in the very back. If we did have it rendered those, we would barely see them at all. So I'm not going to have it render any of the artificial lights in this scene. Interior, sun only, and artificial only does exactly what it sounds like. If it's the sun only, you'll only see the results of the sun coming into the space. If it's interior artificial only, it'll be like a nighttime scene. There'll be no exterior lights. And it'll only be those lights inside of the building that light up the space. And then send an artificial, it'll do both. It'll be both your artificial lights as well as the sun on the inside of the building. Now, if you ever do a rendering and it comes out to be just a little bit dark, particularly if you have your exterior settings on, try to do an interior rendering instead because your interior settings will brighten up the scene just a little bit and sometimes that'll make all the difference in the rendering that you're trying to do. In this case though, it should be a bright and sunny day where the sun is in the sky based on where it is that we're standing in relationship to the building. We're just gonna pick exterior sun only. There's an option here for background. The background allows you to pick no clouds in the sky, a few clouds in the sky, or a very cloudy day. Also, you can pick different colors or any images that you might have of that site. So if you have a JPEG or a bitmap and you want to have that be in the background, you can do that. For this, we're going to do sky and few clouds. I usually recommend just leaving haze all the way over to clear. And finally, I'll point out there is an option down here for being able to adjust the exposure of your image after the fact. And we'll take a look at that here in a minute. Move your mouse up here and now select on the big render button. It'll bring up a dialog box, giving an estimate for how long it's going to take. If there's multiple artificial lights, it'll say there in the dialog box how many artificial lights it's having to process. Also, the screen will usually stay black until it gets to be 50%. If yours hasn't quite reached 50% yet, don't worry about the fact that you've been seeing this box jumping around on the screen and nothing changing. Once it gets beyond 50%, it'll start to render just like you're seeing on the screen here. Certain areas will be a little bit faster than other areas. 
In this case, we can see what a medium level detail of a rendering looks like. It's a pretty good rendering. It is a little grainy when it comes to around these spots where the bricks are at, as well as on top of this roof here. We can see here on the steel, it's just slightly grainy, but it gives you a good quality rendering, and this may be good enough for the presentations that you wanna do. If you set this to be a best rendering instead, and then take the time to render it through at best, it'll look virtually like a photograph when it's done. Once this has been completed, down here we have image, and there's an option to adjust the exposure. If you click on adjust exposure, you'll have a variety of settings related to the brightness and darkness of the image as a whole, your different tones, your shadows, and general image saturation that you can adjust here on the screen. The best advice I can give you is just play with it a little bit and from image to image, condition to condition, you may need to change these settings to adjust them to make your image look just a little bit better. You can always pick on reset to default to put everything back to the default settings and then click on okay to apply those settings. And finally, there's two other options available. One is save to project and the other is export. If you choose export, you can save this image out as a JPEG or a bitmap and then post it on a website or email it to somebody or use it in a presentation. If you choose save the project, it'll ask, what do you wanna name this? And I'm just gonna call this rendering exterior. Then you click on okay to that and it'll save that rendering to your project. Now I don't recommend saving too many renderings to your project because it'll add the size of whatever that image is directly to your file size and make your file size bigger tend to limit those as far as saving it into the project to just those that you want to use on maybe your cover sheet or just for certain display boards. Come up to the big X to finish the rendering dialog. So just remember, if you need to do a rendering, come down and pick the little teapot symbol down at the bottom of the screen and then adjust your settings in the rendering dialog box.